Ass Titties. Hello, Trick Theorists. Welcome back to Talking Tricks. My name is Frank. I'm Jason, and today we're joined by a very special guest who needs little to no introduction, Sam. Hello. Yeah. So obviously we're joined by Kojo. He, I mean, everyone knows him. He runs Kojo's Trick Labs, studying technique day in, day out for hours at a time. He knows like everything about it. And that's kind of exactly what we're going to be talking about today. We're going to be talking about technique and I guess the intricacies of that, because I feel like me and Jason don't talk about that as much. Obviously, as trick theorists, we kind of strip away a lot of the the more nuanced technique and just look at the bare bones uh, basics of what makes a trick a trick. Um, but yeah, I mean, on that thought, I mean, Kojo, do you have any opening thoughts? Yeah. So, so first off, I'd like to frame who I am and what I've done a bit, because I think it... Um, it helps when it comes to understanding the stuff I'm talking about. Uh -huh. So before I ever started Kojo's Trick Lab, I already got into a pretty decent level of tricks, especially with power moves. Like I've done like five gainer switches to triple cork and quite a lot of different power moves. So what I, what I want to differentiate between is that there's a lot of trickers who get to a high level of tricking uh -huh. and then they might be sharing their, their thoughts on technique. Uh -huh. But I can say from the place I'm at now, that person back then doing five gainer switches to triple cork didn't know shit. <laughs> really didn't, really didn't know shit. Truly didn't right. know anything. And I only know that now because mm. of actually working in the field of studying tricking technique day in, day out for the past four years and taking it seriously to the point where it's a job, mm. taking all examples from the best trickers in the world, comparing every tiny detail, spending hours and hours editing it. You learn a different level of information to what I knew before. Mm -hmm. So it's, I think it's kind of interesting because it's a unique experience. I don't think many other people have, have lived that mm -hmm. in the history of tricking, really. It's a weird <laughs> thing to be full time doing that. So um, yeah, I thought I'd mention that because for anyone who's not been a member of KTL, they wouldn't know. And even mm -hmm. people who are, you wouldn't really mm -hmm. fully know what that's like. Because for me, it's been a bit of a, it's been a wild ride. I've learned more than I thought there was to learn, and I know that there's a lot more to learn as well. So yeah, yeah. No, no, I agree. I mean, I think with like any topic that goes into such detail, like the only way you will really get all the information is by, I mean, taking a deep as dive as you have, like making it your full time job to literally look and study clips all day, day in, day out. I mean, people get PhDs and dedicate their whole lives to just like a specific thing, like one specific insect on this continent and knowing everything about it. And <laughs> like, that's literally exactly like, you're just like the PhD of technique, which is crazy to me. And like, and I definitely relate to exactly what you're saying about like, oh, that dude five years ago before KTL did not know shit because I mean, I think everyone as trickers kind of has a, a similar experience where it's like as you progress in tricking you're like oh yeah i'm i'm killing it right now i know like pretty much as much as i can know and then like two years pass and you're like did i really think that like i know so much more <laughs> now like it's crazy um but i think if you look back and you don't say like oh yeah no i was dumb as shit like you probably haven't really grown too much of as uh, of, as a person you know <laughs> yeah you're not learning enough and me thinking because at the time then i thought i did know a lot more than i did that's why i started i wouldn't have started the website if i knew how little i knew about tricks then i wouldn't have even started the site so it's it's funny that it's that kind of confidence when i didn't really mm. know that much mm -hmm. is what's led me to actually know more but um right yeah now i always look at tricks and just understanding tricks in like kind of growth mindset like i uh -huh. will never and can never know everything there is to know about a trick uh -huh. i know quite a lot about some tricks uh -huh. but even the ones i know the most about take like a gain a switch i know uh -huh. there's infinite more there's like so much more knowledge that i could gain five years from now i should know loads compared to what i know now oh yeah i mean th this is just like the dunning kruger effect just like in yeah. full action and for those at home that don't know the dunning kruger effect it's basically like People who know very little of a topic will typically overestimate how much they know, and people who know a lot about a topic tend to underestimate how much they know. 
and I think it comes down to knowing that you have so many known unknowns. Like there's so many spots in tricking that you know you don't know. While someone who might be starting out and might be at a decent level, are they don't even see those unknown unknowns like you know what i mean they're unknown unknowns to them basically. right <laughs> like as as you get better at, at something you just learn that you know very little and that there's more to, there, there's just so much to learn still exactly. and i think i think we relate with that a lot to even in trick theory mm -hmm. uh frank like uh for example on an episode that we're working on coming out soon we're talking about some intricate hand stuff and we're trying to relate some of the hand stuff to like how our feet interact with the floor and uh it's just such a like an, a new territory that we're like looking at it like oh man well you know we thought we had it all figured out but here's this actual like what what is seemingly like a small component is actually like this very challenging like oh great mystery you know like we don't mm -hmm. it, it really challenges what you understand um and yeah so i think that it's yeah well, we thought we could just make it like a one-to-one -one thing. Like, oh, yeah, all the things right. that apply for for feet, you could apply it to hands. It's that easy. And we're so fucking naive. It's so much more complex than that. And, it, I mean, it's going to take a second. So for sure. <laughs> we'll hopefully figure always it out. It always goes deeper. <laughs> yeah, it, it always goes deeper. And it's it's yeah. like the things that you would think that are, like, often overlooked or whatever and tricky that are seemingly insignificant actually have a lot of depth and nuance. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. And, and like in, in the along the lines of like that trick theory like i really do see trick theory and like technique as like two sides of the same coin even though they do very different things because in essence when me and jason talk about trick theory we're stripping all the technique away like we really just don't give a fuck about the technique we're like what is the bare bones thing that makes up this trick while when you look at technique specifically uh like obviously you do care about what trick is happening but you're going way more into the nuances of it to the point where it's just like, I don't even care about how we define the base trick. I just care about how the leg is going up, how the how you're twisting and how you're moving your momentum around and stuff like that. And I mean, I was just kind of curious about your thoughts, Kojo, about that intersection between trick theory and technique, if they're even different in your head to you, well, like, you know. I think you have to... There's, there's some parts of... Well, it's not even trick theory because these things are still true, mm -hmm. but disregarding the idea of base tricks in some sense, mm -hmm. because normally for most tricks, then you can use like a number of very different base base tricks, like ones that you wouldn't expect. Mm -hmm. Like my most successful way of teaching Webster, it starts with a B kick. <laughs> and that way that that teaches it very easily. I've mm -hmm. seen people who are just trying to do it again and again, landing on their heels, falling onto their butt. I teach it them that way and they can learn it in like literally five minutes and be able to do it from standing. Like, Dang. so sometimes, um, I don't know, I guess with my pursuit of finding ways to teach stuff, mm -hmm. then I've kind of had to disregard a lot of that. What I would have thought at first is a base trick for what, like I'd say gain a flash back tuck. I wouldn't is, it's not even related in my mind, really. <laughs> I know, I know how it is. But at the same time, if I was teaching it to someone, trying to teach them in the most efficient, useful way for them to get full control over it, it wouldn't start with a back tuck. Mm -hmm. Right. That's really interesting to me, actually, because, uh, like, it kind of along the lines of what you were saying, you I've heard you talk about before, like, different kinds of quirks. And, like, there's, like, yeah. quirks were used to, like, develop more power and quirks used to do a power trick. Like, that's, you know, like, triple quirk or something like that. And you treat them very differently. And like in trick theory, we just like, oh, it's all one quirk. It's just quirk. That's yeah. the base trick and stuff like that. And that's like what I've always kind of wanted to explore more, to be honest, is like that the way that you could do the same trick in different ways to do different things, I think is a very, uh, I don't know. It, it's, it's a fundamental shift in ideas that I think opens up the world of possibilities and how you trick. You know what I mean? Because you definitely are going to treat them differently. Um, and I mean, I don't know. I kind of just want your insight on that. Like, how is it that you treat tricks differently? Like, obviously, you don't have to go into the, you know, the details of it. But um, I guess an example. I, I think I think that's a big one of the things that makes the best trickers the best. Mm -hmm. If you look at like, you know, people like Shosei and Zen and stuff, just how much they change their tricks for different purposes, mm -hmm. like how different their cork is when they're doing it to a like swinging into a triple cork mm -hmm. versus if it's a cork variation. Like mm -hmm. the, I think the bigger those gaps are, normally the better 
the tricker is and the lower level trickers tend to do everything all as one like the same cork but i'm gonna deleg it or now i'm gonna double it or now i'm gonna swing it but it's the same cork every time right i feel like that's the starting point and the better you get the more they separate from each other right dang yeah no, that's that's an interesting idea and i i feel like i definitely see that at play all the time whenever i'm watching like michael guthrie's tricks and it's like yeah just fundamentally different looking corks for whatever he's doing <laughs> Um, but I guess that kind of brings me to the next point is like, when you look at the world's best trickers, like how much would you say they're really like making it a mental game of focusing on technique versus how much are they putting into training and power and just raw, like muscle memorying it? It's, if that makes okay. any sense. This, this, this is one of my, this is one of the topics I'm most interested in yeah. and I've done yeah, a lot of trying to figure this out and really understand it. And I've got a big edge from knowing these trickers personally and seeing them train. Train. I've trained with pretty much all of them. It really, really helps. Because it's like a really common misconception. People think just because there's some trickers who are really, really good and they don't think about technique mm -hmm. at all. I but know that's the case, yeah. <laughs> not like an anomaly. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to name names for this one, but it's mm -hmm. not... I'm not trying to knock anyone. Everyone I'm going to be talking about is very good at tricks and I'm impressed by all of them and I think they're great. But it's purely just to understand how different, just how it affects progression. Mm -hmm. So a really, really good example is Johan because he's talked about this publicly in like his Jamcast interview. I've seen him train. Johan trains probably harder than anyone else I've ever seen. So mm -hmm. massive respect for Johan. Mm -hmm. But he's he's someone who doesn't think about technique. He doesn't think about how to change tricks. He just does tons of reps. Now that works really well for power moves because the thing is, if you're trying to swing chains trip, if the technique's not good, then you won't land it. Mm -hmm. So let's say you try something 10 times. One of those times is going to have the best technique. Right. You're just going to try and do that technique again. And then 10 more times, one's going to have the best technique. You're going to try and do that again. And over time, you're going to learn really good technique without ever thinking about it. You're mm. just aiming for that really good feeling. Works great with power tricks because if you land or you don't, great feedback. You land comfortably, you don't. Yeah. But just as an aside, like that actually sounds a lot like natural selection for tricks. Like, yeah, it's just pretty, like pretty much. Just a bunch of like any kind of raw <laughs> like variation and then you just happen to get the right one that is the one that like moves on but but it on. doesn't work for everything right that's the thing it doesn't work for everything mm -hmm. because something like a side swipe or a touchdown raise mm. you'll land it <laughs> but it might not you you can land it every time right so there comes a point where it stops getting better because you're landing it comfortably mm -hmm. and out of those 10 times they all feel decent mm. because without consciously thinking about changing something you're not even going to find that one that feels way better right and then that's how like I did mention it in a in a video when I was talking about how great Johan was, so I thought I, I can explain this one as well. Mm -hmm. I had an example of his sideswipe from 2015 and his sideswipe now, mm -hmm. and frame by they look exactly the same. Every frame, <laughs> same inversion, same amount of extension, like bent knee coming over, right. same everything. And he's done he does them all the time. You can look through his posts, he's done probably thousands, the amount mm -hmm. he tricks thousands since then and it's gotten no better mm. because certain tricks it will just hit that point and not get better court corkson another person who doesn't think about technique just thinks about reps it can get you very good at power stuff mm. but your backside nine will just hit a point and it won't ever get any better again <laughs> right. but then you have tiki woo which is both put together loads mm. of reps and thinking about technique and you, you see what happens with him so mm. it's like you can get good by just doing reps, but if you have the reps and the understanding, you do a lot better. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Kojo, do you think that that shift is kind of like a, largely like a tricking gener a generational thing? Because I'm definitely more of the mindset of like, I'll just let natural selection do its job where I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll rep it out. Obviously I'll make tweaks and I, and I do have like internal tech for different things like swing versus dubbing or whatever. Um, but like, you know, I, it seems like a lot of older trickers, you know, are kind of of that, you know, figure it yeah. out for yourself, not so much study that. Yeah, which I think is, it's one of those, it's like, it's fine and it's just preference, but at the same time, um, mm. it's not, I, I think there are problems to it because mm. people have said this about KTL before as well. They've said like, oh, I just like 
I want to just figure out all the technique by myself. I feel like it's cheating if someone gives me advice. Mm. And it's like, I understand that. If you're playing like a video game or something, I quite like, you know, figuring stuff out for myself, not looking at instructions. Mm -hmm. But the thing with tricking is you, you can cause like lifelong damage to your body. It's like, so it's not, it, it's like the stakes are so much higher in tricking. That's why I think it's important. Because if you have all the help you can get, it's still going to be challenging. It's still going to be hard mm -hmm. to get better at tricking. So why make it even more challenging and dangerous is my argument. Yeah. to that approach because it is there are real consequences with tricking if you mess up mm -hmm. i agree with that and i mean it, it also depends on like what goals you have like if you really just you know want to trick for fun and stuff like that then maybe it might be worth it but like you said there's still that potential of injury but if you want to get good really fast i would personally just from like my experience in tricking i would mm. say really focusing on technique is uh yes. a big part of how you get good fast because I remember the time period where I started to get really good really fast. It was because I would literally record every single thing I would do. I would really, like, digest it. I'd be like, okay, what am I doing wrong here? I'd look at tutorials. I'd, like, I mean, I was really going in with that. I haven't done that in years, honestly, and I kind of miss doing that. But definitely haven't gotten nearly as good uh, without that. You know what I mean? Or as fast, yeah. I should say. So yeah and and it's not like everyone has to see this is the thing because it's like if it's boring to you mm -hmm. i know lots of people people just want to go to the session and trick i would have been i was much more like that when i was younger as well i just didn't know anything <laughs> right. um but it's one of those where i think a certain you don't have to go as deep as i go necessarily mm -hmm. but i think you should i think everyone should go to a certain point mm -hmm. just because it's just safer for your body you're not going to be doing there's certain people where when they trick, it's like I can tell how much how much risk you're putting yourself at. And it's like they don't even need to. I can see the part of the trick they don't understand. And if they just knew, then they wouldn't have to be, you know, oh. doing it like that. Absolutely. I've definitely seen trickers where I'm like, I, I mean, as someone who studied literally, like, athletics in my undergrad and physical therapy mm. and shit like that and seeing how people can injure themselves i've become so much more aware of like holy <laughs> shit what the fuck are you doing i'm so scared for your life <laughs> like type shit so um so the interesting thing about this now is it kind of brings me to my next point in that like you you know you have this system of tutorials and stuff like that and i think they're they're really good and you know it teaches you how to do tricks a certain way but something I've noticed about tricking is like it's it's very personal in the sense that everyone has a very different body and body shape and I, different things that make more sense to them also. Yeah. Um, and so obviously there is a certain amount of like uh, when people do a cork, a lot of these things in the technique are going to be the same. But obviously there's still going to be some kind of personal variation depending on body type. Or at least that's my perception of it. And I'm curious as to what you think about you that. Think yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think um, like different styles are going to suit different people. Mm -hmm. But I think there are general rules that apply to everyone. And I focus more on the rules. And when it comes to like the teaching methods, for example, with my B-Twist guide, I've got three completely different methods. Mm -hmm. One of them can teach you just through like if you can just do vert spins. So maybe if you're good at like bait, like kicks, you're not good at inverting. It will teach you that way. The other one builds it up with progressions with spotting in the middle, which I mentioned is, I reckon, it, I think it's the best way to learn it because you can use it to learn other tricks. Mm -hmm. And then I've got another way that teaches it from a front flip half twist on a trampoline as well, working through progressions that way. Mm -hmm. So I understand that depending on people's bases, they're going to find any one of them easier. Mm -hmm. But even in that, I mentioned, like, I do think one of them is the best way to do it. It right. might take some people longer, but it's the best you'll have the most control is the mm. thing. And then when it comes to actually like doing the trick well, when you've already learned it, then yeah, I think that just a lot of the rules do apply to everyone, no matter what your body type is in mm. terms of what you have to do to go higher, what you have to do to invert less, what you have mm. to do to invert more, go lower and faster. Right. Yeah. There's, there's certain themes that everyone can do. It will look different with different people, but they right. can all do it. And, and that makes a lot of sense in terms of like, uh, the micro changes you have to make to, for example, get higher or twist faster. But some people, like, you know what I mean, is some people will need more of that jump height part. Some people might need more of that twisting part. 
And so I guess what you're saying is that they need to see what it is they're quote unquote missing and then use that to change what what they're missing or whatever the fuck, basically. Pretty, pretty much. I kind of, I, so I try to, I try to go over what is, like what makes up good technique to do certain kinds of cork pretty much. Mm -hmm. And then I leave it to the person, like if they can film themselves and then see which bits they're not doing, mm -hmm. then they can kind of coach themselves through that. Cause that's what I see KTL as. It's mm -hmm. meant to be an aid to you coaching yourself. It's not necessarily coaching you cause you can't really do that just for a video cause it's not personalized to you. Right. So I try and give them all the information and also give them the information they need to teach themselves. And then it's down to them to, to try and teach themselves because it will be a bit different for everyone. Okay, cool. So I think something else that I've noticed for me personally, as my tricking journey has progressed is that in different phases of my life, I've learned tricks in different ways, if that makes any sense. And so like really early on, it was my friend saying like, lift up your leg, do this, blah, blah. And then it transitioned to me just watching tricking videos and then trying to replicate that and then watching tutorials and then just, I have, I've kind of stepped away from that. Uh, but like watching people trick in real life and then just asking them advice is like probably my primary way of learning new tricks now. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm just wondering your thoughts about either just your tricking journey about learning different tricks in different ways or which way is the best or if it's a mix of them. I like, guess just your thoughts in general. So um, what I've come to learn over the years, like when I first started teaching, I would always, people would be trying moves. Mm -hmm. This is back when I coached, like before Kojo's Trick Lab, when I didn't know much. Mm -hmm. Let's say they were trying to do a gainer. Right. Then they would try a gainer. And then I would be trying to tell them what was wrong with their technique, tell them like, oh, push your hips forwards as you swing or spot this way or try and do this with your arms. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what you'd think would be the right way to go about coaching at first. You think they're not landing this move, their technique's bad. Mm -hmm. I need to give them advice so they understand the technique better so they can land the move. Mm -hmm. But really when you think about it, technique isn't the first thing. <coughs> <laughs> but, uh, so annoying but yeah uh, technique isn't the first thing mm -hmm. that's going to affect you learning a move mm -hmm. and my arguments for that are dark side tricks okay so i can barely do a call i can do it on a trampoline but i can't do a cork on my bad side on the floor right. why is that my body is strong enough to do a cork yeah surely having been able to do 10 corks to dub uh, mm. surely I understand the technique of a cork well enough. Uh, mm. My body is strong enough to do a cork, so why can't I do a cork? Mm -hmm. It's not fear. It's not a lack of understanding. It's not a lack of power. Right. So why can't I do it to my bad side? And I, that's what made me think, like, that's kind of the best argument for it. And it makes yeah. you realize, well, what's actually important then for learning the move? And it's gaining the awareness. It's gaining the feel of the trick. Mm. Someone who has terrible technique but understands how the trick should feel will do it better than someone with great technique who just doesn't know what they're even aiming for. Ah. So te technique doesn't come first. So that changed the way I taught. I stopped trying to teach people the right technique straight away. Mm. I started trying to think, how, how can I bridge the gap from what they know to what they don't know? And then that's where you get into like, if, because you can turn, I think turning tornado kick into a race is a great way to learn it. I think it's a much better way than doing it from a Gumby. My argument for that is because Gumby's harder to learn than race, so it's like some people say to people, start out with Gumby, and I'm like, what? I struggle with Gumby. No, tornado <laughs> thing all the way. Yeah, yeah pe people think because their argument for that is like, oh, but then you you're able to raise straight over the top, and it's like you don't want to just be able to do a raise with your hands down and then do a raise straight over the top. What's far more useful is understanding every degree of inversion mm. between vertical and upside down. Then you have freedom over your raise. You have complete control. And every step of the way towards getting a raise, you're learning how to take off and land again. You're building that awareness. And the awareness is how you learn the move. Whereas every time you do Gumby, you're not doing a raise. You're going to have to make the leap from hands down to no hands down you're going to have to overcome that. Whereas yeah. I teach it from vert and then building up inversion. So there's never a big obstacle to overcome. And you can do this for every trick. You can start with something simple, make tiny changes until they're doing the harder trick. Mm -hmm. But those tiny changes along the way 
every rep you're building awareness you're building that you get the feel so then when you do get to the trick you know how it should feel mm -hmm. that's why i think that's a much better way of learning than trying to do the whole trick and like failing failing until you land i think it's much better to do these drills that lead up to it i mean it's kind of obvious but yeah. um no, yeah. and, and I, I agree with that philosophy a lot. I actually really like that. An, an example in my life, when I've always taught people, like Mooncake, for example, I tell them to do that little, I, you probably know what I'm talking about, the, the shitty little swing step over, like, hook yeah, yeah. kind of thing. And then you just keep progressing that until it's a Mooncake. And it's it becomes so easy past that point. Like, I've taught people in, like, a few minutes just how to do it just by that. And it's kind of a miracle. And, like... I like the spectrum idea too, uh, because really, I mean, me and Jason have talked about it in our podcast, but every trick really is every other trick and there's just yeah. degrees <laughs> of changes between them. And that's really all that it is. And you're so right that you get so much more freedom to like explore that whole spectrum if you've transitioned through it and stuff like that. And, and I've always done the tornado to rise thing too. I like that yeah. a lot. It's just knowing the steps. That's the mm -hmm. thing. Cause I've seen it. I've seen it not work like the gainer one where you start just swinging around the side until you're going upside down. I've seen it not work in the past mm -hmm. and people have blamed the method and said, oh, but if you learn it that way, you can't flip. And that's just down to like missing links in mm -hmm. the chain. If the coach doesn't know the right thing to tell them to get them to invert more, if they're just telling them to swing more over your head, that's what people will say who aren't, who don't know that much about it. They'll mm -hmm. say, you need to swing to your shoulder. You need to swing over your head. The reason why they're not inverting is because if your hips are sat backwards as you swing, mm. then your leg's going to automatically start to turn around the side. Yeah. So that's the actual root of the problem. And mm. if you don't fix that, if the coach doesn't know that that's what needs fixing, then they'll just keep doing it around the side forever. Right. So it's not the actual method. It's normally just a lack of of knowledge of like how to progress it properly. Yeah, this actually totally brings me back to undergrad in that like we had a teacher who when so when we were like evaluating orthopedic injuries and stuff like that, he was always like, you got to find the cause of the cause. So it's like, yeah, they have knee pain, but you can't just treat the knee pain because that knee pain has a cause. Like it might be a hip imbalance. It might be something in their foot, like, you know, ankle instability or some shit like that. But you got to figure that out or else you're never going to get to the root cause of it. And I definitely see that as what you're doing. Like, I mean, I could tell someone all day to just like, yeah, just invert more or just you yeah. know, do this more. But harder. Yeah, exactly. And honestly, I kind of do that. Like, I'm not going to lie. Whenever people ask me tricks, I'm like, yeah, you just stop being a little bitch. Just do it. That's what I did as well. It's like before before spending all this time, because my ultimate guides, it's when it's, I spend over 100 hours on just that one trick. Mm -hmm. For about a month, I become fully immersed in trying to find as much as I possibly can. Mm -hmm. With every one of those videos, my goal is to know way more about the trick than when I started making the video. Mm -hmm. And normally I start making the video when I already know quite a lot. Right. So you learn way more. But yeah, with the cause of the cause, it's like um, Malik. Yeah, you mentioned Malik earlier. Mm -hmm. So his double B twist, he posted on his story mm -hmm. asking for advice on his double B twist. I do remember that. And he shared the responses and everyone was telling him, you need to kick your leg higher. <laughs> everyone was telling him that. Right. But that wasn't what was the problem. Mm -hmm. And I think this is just because because technique isn't talked about that much. Everyone has all these assumptions that are kind of wrong. Now, he did need to get his leg higher. Mm -hmm. But just telling him to kick his leg higher won't work. Because the problem was he was kicking his leg while he was standing up straight. How high can you kick your leg when you're standing up straight? Mm -hmm. it, it doesn't go high behind you. Right. So it was a timing issue, which is because he was dipping at the wrong time. He was mm -hmm. dipping with his weight in the wrong place. So you actually have to go back to the step to fix when he dips and when he lifts in order to get the leg higher. Wow. But everyone just jumped to the leg higher. It was just, <laughs> it was interesting for me. Like, everyone's saying this and that's like, yeah. you know, that's not the actual root of the problem. Pe oh. People miss the root of the problem a lot and I don't blame them because mm. so, so did I and so do I still because I know a lot about some tricks there's still loads of tricks that I do not know much about because there's just so many of them yeah you know it, so. I, it's crazy how much of a trained eye you need for this shit like it's like I because that's something I definitely would not have picked up on I would have said the same thing everyone else is saying pick up your leg yeah. <laughs> you know? that, that's what it seems like yeah at first glance but mm -hmm. yeah Right. It's always more. <laughs> well, so, I think I think what it is is triggers have like a general idea of like what's wrong, but like you said, that they're not 
because trickery isn't as talked or not sorry uh trick technique isn't as talked about as much we don't know like the specifics for what could cause something like that to go wrong right you're saying yeah and something else interesting about learning tricks actually um i had this theory when i was first learning tricks that i don't know if it's correct i mean it's only gotten me this far so it can't be that correct but um the way that i would approach learning either a new trick or a new technique for a trick is i noticed that i could not focus on five different fixes to my technique at once i could not focus on but like lifting my leg but also making sure my arms go up but also making sure that i look and look over i could not focus on all those things at once so what i started doing was i would focus on just one technique fix at once and i would make it so that it was muscle memory so it happened no matter what so i would get my leg up on a cork every single time regardless and then once that became like walking to me then i would you know make my other fix to the thing and make that muscle memory until it keeps building up I found that to be pretty successful for me personally, um, but I was just wondering about your thoughts on that approach. I've I've made a video about that exact thing actually. Oh, really? Okay. <laughs> I call I call it I call it a focal point. I always try and think of something something memorable for people to mm. to help them get it. But yeah, and just changing one thing at a time. The, mm. I think that that is the best way to just keep refining things because you can always find something to improve, no matter how good you think you are at whatever basic trick. There's always something. And I think that every trick you do in a combo, you should always, you don't always have to think about every combo, but mm -hmm. you should be able to look at any one of your tricks and you know what your current like focal point is. You right. should know what thing is your biggest issue that you're working on improving. And there'll always be a biggest issue. With my best tricks, there's still a biggest issue that I'm working on improving. And right. I think that's what keeps your style getting nicer and nicer. If you don't have that, then you can be doing tricks efficiently, but they just won't they wouldn't look nicer or get better after a certain point. Okay, yeah, no, that, that makes sense. And I kind of like that there's been, like, obviously I'm not going to act like I'm the originator of this because I'm sure a lot of people have had this thought. But I like to have that independent, like, you came up with that and I came up with that independently and I'm sure other trickers have. Um, I feel like that's a really good justification for that way of going about things, if that makes any sense. Um, yeah. R Riku, I heard Riku say it first. It's uh, like I already kind of did it, but Riku put it into words when I was like, yeah, I do. That does make a lot of sense. Because sometimes I would try and think about two things at once and it, yeah, doesn't I, work. I've noticed that a lot of things in tricking technique is actually putting stuff to words. Because, like, I will have formulated a thought about a specific thing or a specific mm. way to do a thing, but I just don't quite understand it in depth. But, like, Sometimes I've noticed that uh, some people will say a technique fix in just slightly different terms and I'll all of a sudden understand it. Like I had this yeah. this revelation with Cheat 7 specifically actually. Um, someone was, people would always tell me like, oh, pump your leg over, that's how you cheat 7. You know what I mean? I'm like, okay, what does that even mean? Like I don't even know. And then I don't even remember the exact phrasing, but I think it was like Manny Ramos told me a specific way to cheat seven. And he's like, yeah, you got to do this and this and this. And it like just clicked for me and it just made sense. And I was like, whoa, like, okay. Um, so like, yeah, I, I don't know. I guess I'm wondering like your, your thoughts on like different wording. Cause obviously people just respond to different ways of like talking yeah. about tricks. <laughs> it's weird. Well, in my work around for that is obviously I do try and have a number of ways of explaining the same thing but also this is where I, I think videos can be a really really powerful tool mm. because in the past tricking tutorials weren't heavily produced shall mm. we say there mm. wasn't much production on them but lots of the time so I'll try and, a good way for me to get a point, point across is I aim to make a tutorial understandable even if you had the audio off i tried to make it so you could understand what my point is if there if i wasn't speaking that's how that's the clarity that i aim for with the edit and you can normally do that by like isolating the specific thing you're talking about and rewinding it playing it again in slow motion zooming in having arrows and motion graphics like making it incredibly clear like this is happening here right. and breaking tricks down into and only break tricks down into like the first point of contact because mm -hmm. it's one thing to understand like when to dip in a beat twist and all of that but you need something to like 
tied to. You need an anchor. Mm. So I think first point of contact is a really good way to start understanding technique. Where is their body when they first touch the ground at their setup? Where is the head and chest and the arms when they first touch? I'd say that's one of the most key things. Mm. And then where is their body when they last touch as they take off? Also very key. Mm. Key things happen in between in all tricks, but that's normally... Yeah, I normally use that as a starting point to try and explain technique to people because you, you need something like tangible, some, something real. Yeah. When your foot first touches the ground, that's a real thing. Yeah. I'm not just telling you to get your chest <laughs> lower at the start because when's the start, you know? Like you need, you need an actual anchor point. So I, I agree. Yeah. And, and I think words mean different things to different people too. So sometimes there's like miscommunication in that front. So I think you're right. That's seeing a visual thing. Like, I mean, it, it's very hard to to misconstrue that i mean it's possible yeah. but <laughs> yeah. you know um and interestingly like you know i i feel like a lot of trickers are really into i guess body mechanics and just like knowing like their body and muscles and different stuff like that but a lot of people don't know what hips mean like i know that yeah. sounds <laughs> weird but like yeah like some people don't know what hips mean some people don't know what they mean by like oh you gotta you know do this specific motion right, like, or whatever. So yeah, I agree. I think having the imaging is very important. Um, yeah. But so I have this interesting idea, uh, or I guess something I kind of want to ask you about uh, tricking technique. And me and Jason were kind of talking about this thought experiment the other day. But what if I were to get Shosei's brain now we're to implant it into just a normal ass dude's body. <laughs> do you think that he could still do at least some of the crazy shit he could do? Like, would he be able to do all of them? Would he be able to do like very little? Like how much of it comes down to technique, I guess is what I'm saying. How much of it comes down to muscle or what your muscles are used to? <laughs> That's a really interesting one. Mm -hmm. I think I think he'd be able to do a lot of it. Mm -hmm. But Shose is one of those who really stood out to me in the sense of um, where his body differed to other people when I've seen him in person. Because that is kind of, that's so that's his edge. I, I think what makes Shose like, you know, doing the absolute hardest things, I think his body gives him that edge. But I think what makes him in the top 0.1% is everything else. It, it, his body is just that little extra boost. So even with a much worse body, assuming the person was somewhat in, in shape, mm. I think he'd still be able to do quite a lot, like, you know, like dub-dub combos and stuff, mm. even if the body wasn't that strong, just because of his understanding of technique. Yeah. Sho Shose is a really interesting one with technique, because he's kind of, he, he's invented loads of, loads of like technique breakthroughs. Like the way he's so good is like doing things in a way that no one else has ever done them before. Like not just through power, but really changing the way tricks are done it's really interesting right so we actually have a note about shosei's tricking and breakthroughs and tricking and i want to get to that but i think uh my personal opinion on whether or not like if you took like shosei's brain and threw it into like a muggle's body even if the muggle is pretty fit i i, th I think it would be kind of closer to like experiencing dark side tricking um <laughs> and, and i mean like because like, like yes you have like this understanding and like you maybe physically done the tricks like you know in this hypothetical brain situation mm. uh but like i feel like uh if your body like just physically doesn't know like how to do those things like even if your brain does right because like you could for example even trickers we could watch a clip of someone doing like a really complex transition we could probably or sorry tr trick not transition we could probably get pretty close mm. but like you know we may still end up like flailing our legs or something in like a like, you know, Phelan yeah. Hyperhook or something, you know. I, um, I feel like most of the problem would come to the difference in body shape. Like, you just won't be used to that or whatever. Yeah. I think that's that's where my primary concern comes in. But for the most part, I, I want to agree with Kojo that I feel like a lot of tricking really does come down to knowing technique uh, rather than, like, a muscle kind of thing. Because, like, I mean, even trickers, like, are... I mean, you've seen the best trickers. They're not, like, buff dudes. They're not, like, super developed muscularly and stuff like that. And that being said, they do have very specific muscles that are very strong, and that does help them to an extent. Uh, but I think the overwhelming majority of how we get good at tricks is having the knowledge of how to do those tricks, if that makes any sense. 
So yeah, I, I just think I mean this. Um, I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know enough about where the actual information <laughs> is stored. When people say muscle memory, I don't know. I don't understand enough of the science to know. Mm. Does that mean just you know? Is that actually all in your brain, or it, how is anything anything else? So yeah, when everything. it comes to that, I just don't know. <laughs> what if we got his brain and all his nerves? Because <laughs> that's the yeah. Thing. If, <laughs> if yeah, like, I mean that. There's just other things too, like, like you know, the the muscles that like anyone, even if they were like a bodybuilder or whatever, they wouldn't have the the muscles developed specifically for tricking, you know, and or like the maybe like the muscle like fast muscle twitch or whatever, mm. um, you know, they may not have the same like to the same degree as you had in your previous body. Right. True. Like, I I do think that mostly the I, so I'm just imagining imagining from the perspective. Of he still he remembers how all the moves feel and everything. He knows he knows how they feel, but it's like he's got this this body suit on kind of where it's like a bit longer, it's heavier, and it's just like okay. slowing him down, making it harder. That that's kind of how I'm picturing it. And I'm thinking with that, he'd yeah. still be able to do a lot. Seeing as he swung out of like scoop quad, like that when you really think about that level, how good he has to be at scoop quad, mm. then what is a scoop dub to him? Yeah, How easy yeah. <laughs> does scoop dub feel to him, really? Yeah. If he can add two two spins and swing it, yeah. that, so that's what makes me think he could do some stuff. You know? Oh no, I, I agree. He could definitely pull off some non-muggle abilities. <laughs> you know, some pretty advanced stuff, especially for like base trickers, because Jose is who he is. Right. Uh, but no yeah I, I think the bodysuit analogy is actually the perfect analogy and that's almost like pretty much how i pictured it so yeah i could absolutely agree with that oh but, i pictured like some freakish frankenstein experiments or like some dude's getting his seven foot head, tall yeah, some like head cut open and like your brain's literally transplanted it's uh, some nail sticking out of his neck for some yeah. reason who knows why but <laughs> but okay well Kind of on the the subject of Shosei, I remember last time we were talking, Kojo, you brought up that Shosei did gain a switch in a particular way that, like, blew your mind or you thought was, like, changing the game for gain a switch. And we could talk about that specifically, um, but more so than that, I'm kind of curious as to what you think about the meta of trick technique and how... I guess far along we are in it and what i mean by that is is there still a lot of technique left to figure out like is there some hidden court ne technique that like no one has figured out yet that might change the game like forever or some shit like that like you know what i mean yeah so so i think everything no, nothing's been fully refined like there's going to be a lot more refinement the main thing the japanese kids did like shosei and zen mm -hmm. what they've really changed and how they do these incredibly hard power tricks is they've just kind of reinvented all of their setups in a way that's different to generations before them. Like Guthrie got a lot of power from a lot of his setups, mm. but he wasn't doing it like those Japanese kids. They just get lower and faster and travel further. Like it's not like they have super powers is why they're doing this stuff. It's more because they are using different technique to what anyone used to do. And the main thing, and this is the thing that he did in his gain of switch, but he does it, um, Shosei and Zen do this in cart full, they do this in cork, rap full, everything that they're using as a power setter mm -hmm. is um, allowing your knee to bend way more in the takeoff. Mm -hmm. So they go onto a flat foot rather than with their, having their weight more on the balls of their toe, balls of their feet. Mm -hmm. And they do this in all of their single setups and it allows them to bend their legs way more. And when you bend your legs more, then your head and chest can go through a bigger range of motion. The bigger range of motion you go through will connect it to the ground, the faster you're gonna flip. Right. It also means that they can take off with their head and chest lower, so they're flipping around a lower point. Lower point you flip around, faster you're gonna flip. Yeah. You're also gonna travel a bit more, you're gonna finish with your head and chest lower, mm -hmm. you're gonna get a better blocking angle with more speed. So um, just that one change has made a huge difference to what's possible for them and like five years ago no one did that even really low whippy falls and gainer switches you wouldn't see anyone bend their knee anywhere near that much that just wouldn't wouldn't happen mm -hmm. and that's why they were nowhere near as powerful it's not like their bodies are that powerful and that's why they can do this stuff it's more these these little technique changes are what unlock the kind of next level of tricking if you look even further back looked like 2008 
no one had even figured out how to do a low fast cork yet. <laughs> and that, that didn't exist. That's fair, we, yeah. we just did a cork and then we swung to dub and it was really hard. I remember how <laughs> floaty those looked. They would J-step yeah. and like super high, just fucking... <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah, that was a different tricking era for sure. And the interesting yeah. thing about you just saying all of that was like, everything about what they did was intuitive to me. And, and the fact that like, I know that when I'm swinging into something, I want to make it low and whippy because then I want to get hella power afterwards. That was something that was very intuitive to me. But, and I think it's intuitive to everyone else, um, but I think the fix of how to get there is very counterintuitive because usually people are like, yeah, you got to fully extend your leg. You got to, you know, really jump and shit like that. Yeah. <laughs> and here you're just like almost tripping yourself is like what it sounds like to me that you're saying. So Yeah, yeah pretty, it's like there's ways you'd be doing what seems like bad technique in order to do the best technique, which is funny. <laughs> it's like it... Chose doesn't push his hips forwards at all as well when he mm -hmm. does like gain a switch when he does one of those gain a switches mm -hmm. normally you'd want to really push your hips forwards because the more you push your hips forwards the more you can arch your back the more you can extend your leg and it means you have less flip to do in the air little tangent but this is a really interesting one right. in my ultimate gain a switch guide i looked at my old gain of switches back when i could do like five or six mm -hmm. and i um i worked out like the amount of degrees of rotation that's done in the air and now when I do gain a switch, there's 50 degrees less rotation than there used to be when I did it. Dang. So no wonder it feels way easier and I can do way more because I'm doing less of a flip every single switch. It, I know it seems like small margins, but nearly a sixth less of a flip is like... It's a bit, big difference. Well, so, especially yeah. when you build them up on top of each other. You yeah. know, then you're cutting out That's shit ton of degrees. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like imagine you're doing a whole... If you're doing a whole flip every time, it's going to be really hard. And mm -hmm. over time, trickers have learned how to do less of a flip. Mm -hmm. And that's what that's kind of what efficiency is. The less of a flip you can do, the easier it's going to be to do it. <laughs> that's true. But you still want it to look like you're doing a flip. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I found that like getting into like, you know, I'm in medical school right now. Getting into just like the depths of any subject is... Like, I mean, you always learn these rules early on of like, this is definitely something you shouldn't do. This is definitely something that's not allowed. This is definitely something that's bad. But I feel like the more you get into the weeds of anything, trick through your technique, medicine, you're like, well, this thing that we think is bad could actually be good in certain contexts. Like, you know what I mean? Yeah. And like, we might give a medication that usually would cause someone to have heart palpitations at some point, but actually fixes this other thing at this other point, doesn't give them heart palpitations. Like, you know what I mean? It's like, it's different as you go along and you realize that like there's just very specific things for different things <laughs> that makes yeah sense. well i've got a really good example of that actually it's like so for example you want to get power out of the b twist uh -huh. if you invert more go lower and faster you can get more power as a general rule right now if someone's asking me if they're trying to swing a b twist they've never swung it they're trying to do a gainer out of it i wouldn't be telling them to do a b twist like that because if you're trying to learn your first swing out of a B-twist, well, the hard part is learning how to control the landing and carry momentum into the next trick. Mm -hmm. You're not going to be struggling from a lack of power. Mm -hmm. So I would get them to flip less and go a bit higher. Even though it reduces the amount of power they get, it gives them more time in the air. It makes it less scary and more comfortable to swing. Mm -hmm. So there's stuff like that where you're sometimes telling people, to have less a, a technique that gives them less power mm -hmm. but it'll make them progress faster because of those other reasons right and um yeah there's just a lot of misconceptions with that like you always you don't necessarily always want to be going as getting as much power as possible like if you're doing a variation swing now mm -hmm. if you wanted power out of that variation swing you do it as low as you could mm -hmm. but you want it to look sick yeah you know <laughs> of course so it might be better to do it higher with a big variation even though you're sacrificing some power just because it's cooler looking. Like, mm. there's, there's a lot of layers to it. There's there's so many layers. There's so many different ways you could do about do it. And, like, I mean, tricking... We're talking about 3D space, moving your body through 3D space. Yeah. There's so many different <laughs> ways to uh, modify that so that you can get a desired effect, whether that's aesthetics, power, whatever the fuck it might be. So, I don't know. That's something I've always appreciated about KTL is, like, the fact that you have a bunch of different tutorials from a bunch of different people explaining different types of tricks of the same base trick yeah. or whatever the hell. And, you know, like that really does give 
it, it matches up with the spirit of tricking that we always talk about, where it's just, like, you know, very uh, based on freedom and doing whatever you want to do and, like, kind of mixing and matching shit. So, yeah. No, I think that's really sick. Um, Jason, did you have... Uh, you, you said you were going to bring something up earlier. Oh, I was just talking about some of the... Uh, some of the breakthroughs Jose was doing, um, mm -hmm. we kind of just touched on them uh, regarding like, uh, like, I guess I was more interested in like how we actually see these things like occur, like how you, how can you like identify something as like a breakthrough? Obviously, if someone's doing something ridiculous, it's clear <laughs> that they're doing something different. But um, yeah, right. The subtle ones. Yeah, they, exactly. Yeah, there are very subtle breakthroughs as well, the, uh, which are kind of the more interesting ones sometimes, mm. because they they apply to everyone. Like Shosei doing a, yeah, you know, like double full double D leg, it's not that helpful for your average tricker <laughs> in terms of understanding things. Right, <laughs> right. Um, but uh, but him doing know. his weird like off axis shit maybe. Yeah, like yeah. that for example. That that's a yeah, that's a great example. Mm -hmm. And um, Andrew Court as well doing that. Right. Really good right. example of a tech breakthrough that might they might not have found it deliberately. Mm -hmm. Well, I know they have in Japan because they do prep it. They prep full ins by doing like a late nine or late round or whatever oh. you want to call it. Like that's what they do to prep it. So they deliberately use that progression chain. It's not by accident. That's so but um, yeah, it's really useful to know that. If you keep if you keep your left knee in, if you turn in left and you look over your shoulder, then it will make you do give the illusion of a flip. flip. Right. Like where you look can make you do a flip. For, like aerial helicoptero. So I've learned a lot about aerial helicoptero. You mm -hmm. probably would think that this is what I thought at first. It seems so hard. You think about doing an aerial, pulling your leg down and back up again. Right. That seems pretty hard. Yeah. But really, the hard part is getting to your landing position. So you can land comfortably, landing in mega with your hips in front of you. Right. So how am I going to get there? Mm -hmm. Well, if you focus everything, if you focus your arms, head, and chest on swinging across your body horizontally as hard as possible, and then kick your leg back, then you'll end up kind of landing towards mega because your momentum's pulling you around that way. Right. So by treating it like a butterfly kick, Mm -hmm. then it's going to be much easier for me to get into the right landing position. Yeah. And then if I, and then I can kind of reverse engineer it, take mm -hmm. that easy butterfly kick tech. I want to make it an aerial. I look at the floor. If you look at the floor in a butterfly kick, then it kind of turns into an aerial. Yeah. So yeah, that's just an example where you can progress to a hard move from not what you'd expect. You'd think you'd go from an aerial, but it might actually be better to, to approach it from a completely different thing that's so funny right. that you say that exact example because uh andrew court actually taught me aerial helicopter or cart aerial cart helicopter sorry um by telling me to do a really shitty cartwheel and i think what mm. he was getting at there was b kick cartwheel kind of thing you know yeah. what i mean and yeah that was definitely way more helpful and and I agree with you in that, like, a lot of people, like, will shit on Andrew Court for being like, oh, that wasn't a true cork in and stuff like that. And, I mean, to an extent, rightfully so. Like, you know, you want to call a cork in a cork in. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, like, I really do think that that technique is invaluable in the progression towards cork in. And, like, I mean, you look at the gym gymnastics, they have nothing like this. They just have to start double backing they just have to start going for double yeah. flips like you know what i mean is there's no easy spectrum way for them to just like uh you know transition into doing double flips <laughs> so well in addition to that like you had mentioned the stakes of a trick being important to like preventing injury and this yeah. pseudo backflip out or the shant out we could call it uh provide like you know definitely lowers the stakes on an already high stakes trick and I think you said it last time we talked, Sim, was like, you know, you don't want to be throwing fully inverted, like, cork in back outs every time, because what are you going to do with the one or two that you actually land, yeah. you know, yeah. versus <laughs> using something like the shant out? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you want to make it easy so you're landing it every time mm -hmm. and then progress it to what you want. It just, it makes sense as the right way to learn it. Start cheated and then refine it, rather than trying to just go for the refined version, because mm -hmm. then you kind of, it, it, you're just doing too much of a leap in one go. Yeah. Like there's yeah. always a way to kind of, yeah, m make it easier on, on the road to it. Yeah. I think that's refreshing for a lot of trickers to hear from 
the tricking technique guru because like you know sometimes i feel like there's a a culture in tricking of just you just fucking throw it you just throw the trick and you just know it and so like well, you know sorry, sorry what are you gonna say no no gotcha. uh, but yeah just hearing this makes it like a lot more digestible of like okay i could start here and then eventually progress there and i don't have to be hard on myself or whatever you know well you know like so here's a misconception. People always say, like, to be really good at TDR, you need to have a good Gumby. Mm. It's like, you don't. I learned TDR first way before. Yeah, <laughs> TDR is easier. It's, e it's an easier move. I can't and even Gumby. Of... <laughs> to this day, I can't Gumby. An interesting one about Gumby as well is that's one of those moves where that really is about your body. Your body plays such a huge role. And the same with that whole technique of side swipe and raise and stuff mm -hmm. how like how you approach it should be different depending on your body like i mentioned this in a side swipe tutorial i did mm -hmm. i struggled with it for ages because i was thinking that i had to take off facing straight and you don't that only works for people who have really open hips that technique mm -hmm. works great for people like michael guffrey and um alex hunter right. who were really flexible as tiny children and kept <laughs> it up but if you started when you were 16 like me and you couldn't touch your toes that that method's just not going to be the way for you. Yeah, like stepping round further works much more naturally for my body. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I do think just people being aware of that that depending on your flexibility level, different techniques are going to work better for you. That goes back to what you said earlier with different body types and stuff. And lot that's the problem when you just have people like Michael Guffrey or these really good trickers teaching. Most of the all of the really good trickers, all of the most elite trickers started when they were little kids. Mm -hmm. They all had flexibility from a very young age right. and kept it. Right. So when they try and give tips to people who started as adults, it's just not that useful because they don't, and you can't blame them. They just don't get it. They're like, well, I tried it like this. It worked for me, Right. but they don't. Wow. So they're not, I used to be really pissed about it <laughs> that I started tricking so late. I was like, well, if I had started as a little kid, <laughs> I would have been so great at this. I've put in, I've prepared to put in so much work right. and I would have been so good. But now I've realized it's kind of a blessing because it's what makes me a really good coach because I know what it's like to be really inflexible. Mm -hmm. I know what it's like to be not the optimal size and way too tall to be really good at tricks. Right. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and it, it does help. It helps you to understand people's struggles. Whereas if you start as a little kid and you're just kind of great all the way through, yeah. you're just never really going to get it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I agree. I, I don't think there could have been a better person to start KTL. So I'm glad it was you. Um, but yeah, I mean, I th I've asked you pretty much all the questions I've wanted to ask you. Do you have any like last thoughts before we end this? Um, no, that's pretty much it. I, I would just encourage people to look into look into technique more, and because mm. it's interesting, there's always more to learn. Look at a trick that you think you already know a lot about, mm. and just try and find something new that you've not thought of before, and just keep doing that, and you'll you'll know a lot. <laughs> yeah, of course. No, I think that's a really good idea. <laughs> Um, but yeah, Kojo, thank you so much for being on. This is honestly such a great talk. Like I, I learned a lot from this, so I appreciate you for coming on. Um, yeah. but yeah, as always, uh, thank you to Steve Rogers for the intro song. Alex Hunter for being in the logo. Yep. And Steven French <laughs> for the logo. So I'll catch you guys later. Yeah. Team effort. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right.